point. I'm Emma Halliday from Green Space Scotland. I'm one of the organisers of um, this the Innovation Summit. Um, Green Space Scotland are a partner um, of um, the Connecting Nature project. So I'm joined um, on the screen at the moment with um, Gemma Lawrence from um, Creative Carbon Scotland and Hama, Hannah Imlach, who's a visual artist um, hyphen researcher. Um, and they're both going to be um, doing a short presentation today. What we're going to do is um, Gemma's going to go up first and followed by Hannah. We're going to try and squash this all into 20 minutes. Um, what we'd really like to do, which, which didn't happen in my last session, but it, it's not to say it's not going to happen this time. If you would like to come so that we don't feel that we're just speaking to our monitors, if after they've done the presentation, if you are happy to share your audio and video, there's a blue button that you can press um, to request that. And um, you can join our little cafe um, on the screen here and we ask questions, we can have a discussion. If you don't want to do that, it's fine. We can just keep an eye on the chat um, and we will um, answer questions or comments and we can post some information if there's particular things. So I'm going to hand over um, to Gemma um, to start us off. Great. Um, well, yeah, thanks very much, Emma, and to Green Space Scotland for inviting me to be part of the session this afternoon. Um, as Emma said, I'm the Culture Shift Manager at Creative Carbon Scotland. And for those of you who are new to us, we're a charity focused on supporting the unique role of this cultural sector in achieving the transformation to a more sustainable Scotland. And my role specifically entails supporting collaborations between arts and sustainability practitioners to address the climate emergency through what we describe as embedded artist projects which are essentially projects where artists and non-arts practitioners work collaboratively, mixing their skill sets, practices and competencies to address important social and environmental issues. So I just wanted to help um, share a little bit of wider context today as to why culture has an important role to play and what some of the benefits are of working collaboratively with creative practitioners before handing over to Hannah to share some of her experience and perspective as a visual arts researcher. So first of all, why are the arts important in addressing climate change? At Creative Carbon Scotland, we see climate change as as much a cultural issue as it is an issue of political, scientific or economic importance. I think we're all aware that transformational change is required if we're to successfully transition to a net zero carbon society and adapt to the impacts of climate change in a just and fair way. But scientific consensus and technological breakthroughs don't necessarily translate into action. And so we believe arts and culture have an essential role in achieving this transformation by influencing our wider culture and facilitating fundamental changes to how we live and organize our societies. So in Scotland and more widely internationally, there are a growing number of artists and sustainability practitioners who are seeking to work together to tackle complex environmental issues including those relating to nature-based solutions. And I just wanted to share a few example here, examples here by way of illustrating um, what we see as some of the value and benefit of such approaches. So I will now um, smoothly transition to sharing my screen, hopefully. Um, can you see that okay? Fab. Um, so this, first slide is an image from an artist called Jenny Kendler, who was the artist in residence with the Natural Resources Defence Council in the United States for five years, working with programme staff on projects, including this milkweed dispersal balloons, which helped local communities improve habitats for endang the endangered monarch butterfly by distributing biodegradable balloons to spread floating milkweed seeds in less green urban areas. The NRDC recognise the value of working long term with artists in what they describe as giving them a seat at the table to help shape projects that highlight key environmental issues and also bring a different approach to achieving their aims such as science communication and community engagement. 
more closely to home in Scotland, this is the Dundee Urban Orchard Project. And here two artists, Jonathan Baxter and Sarah Gittens, co-designed and constructed orchards with 25 different groups in Dundee, including schools, communities and libraries with partial funding support from Dundee City Council. And here the project aimed to better connect people with their food and promote the idea of environmental, social and economic food sustainability whilst demonstrating a model for community involvement and empowerment in urban greening and growing initiatives. And finally, this is a photo from a project which took place in Ghent in Belgium in 2019, where four artists were invited by local cultural organisations to explore our radically changing climate as part of Drift. At four different times of the year, the artists invited residents to experience how they were dealing with the consequences of climate change, including through this floating lab by Maria Lucia Cruz Correa, who invited participants to deal with feelings of loss or grief that we're experiencing as a result of the climate emergency. So I think projects such as these demonstrate how the arts and artistic approaches can also help us connect to our deeper feelings and emotions that are often less considered in our response to climate change. So yeah, I hope these um, examples have helped to sort of highlight some of the benefits that we perceive of working with creative approaches to supporting nature-based solutions and also some helpful background as to why arts and culture have such an important role to play. Um, I should also mention that we've recently launched uh, what we call an embedded artist toolkit to help people who want to find out more about this approach to working and also support partnerships to be developed. So I'll share that in the chat in a moment. Um, and yeah, I will now hand over to Hannah to share more of some of her experience of working um, directly on nature conservation focused projects. Thank you, Gemma. I'm really pleased to be here and to be contributing to this discussion. So I am a visual artist and um, who researches um, and creates sculptures and photographic works informed by specific environmental contexts. I'm fascinated by the diverse ecologies and the practices of exploration, research, conservation and restoration undertaken to better understand and protect them. This fascination has underpinned the projects I've take, undertaken over the last 10 years, shown on this slide, which is taken from my website homepage and my current PhD research project, which I'll introduce today. I'm in the second year of a uniquely structured creative practice PhD conducted in partnership with the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds at their Loch Lomond Nature Reserve, which is the organisation's first arts humanities supported studentship. And I'm hosted within the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. And I sought out this unusual research context as I find communities of specialist environmental knowledge um, creatively stimulating to work within. My artworks are undoubtedly enriched by experiences and the relationships I've gained through partnerships of this nature. Um, but importantly, I believe by situating my creative research in these contexts, my process and artworks can be in dialogue with and contribute to a greater range of critical environmental and climate discourses. So to introduce my process, um, my projects are driven by fieldwork experiences, sustained on-site exploration, the knowledge generating practices of the individuals and communities I work within, and then studio-based, oh, apologies, and then studio-based research, building a bank of creative, um, sorry, just trying to get my film to work. Here we are. Um, and then studio based research building a bank of creative, scientific and archive based sources exploring the specific qualities of each site. These aesthetic environmental references become my source material for sculpture, fed by ongoing dialogue with project collaborators, drawing, model making and material experimentation. The outputs of these projects are primarily site specific sculpture, but also include film and photographic works, exhibitions, workshops and publications. Pictured are works resulting from an 18-month residency with the Peatland Partnership, creating sculptures in response to the ecology and restoration of the Flow Country, an area of blanket bog in the northeast of Scotland. This piece was developed with colleagues from the University of Edinburgh Changing Oceans Group, who 
um, who study deep sea cold water coral reefs um, off the west coast of Scotland. And this work comes from my enduring interest in community initiated renewable energy transition, which I've explored with communities on the Isle of Egg, North Uist, and in Aberdeen. So the partnership structure and, and context of my PhD uniquely suited this trajectory, allowing me to extend my creative research within the vibrant environmental research community um, of the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh, but as a fellow researcher and arts practitioner. And my PhD also offered a rich research site and a conservation community to work within. Um, my field site, the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve, sits at the mouth of the River Endrick encompassing wet woodland, peatland fen, grassland and wildflower meadow, home to communities of migratory birds, beetles, butterflies and moths, alongside mammals like otter, deer, badger and beaver. And my research aims to creatively explore the reserve's diverse ecologies, investigating what role site-specific artwork can play in strengthening multi-species connection and in what ways this artwork can embody and communicate knowledge relating to current environmental research and conservation practices. So to explore the specific webs of interaction that make up the reserve's ecology, I'm currently focusing on two species. The first is a community of Greenland white-fronted geese that overwinter on the loch. These at-risk migratory geese are at the centre of the reserve's conservation designations and therefore influence how the site is managed and interacted with. My second focus is the reserve's nocturnal moth activity Moths are arguably some of the most charismatic inhabitants of the reserve, but often go unnoticed as they spend much of their life cycle in hard to detect stages of metamorphosis and are principally nocturnal. So during the first year of my PhD, when restrictions allowed, I participated in field work on site, including dawn goose roost surveys, moth trapping and identification. And I continue to be influenced by the species specific attentiveness developed by conservation practitioners and the tools and technologies of animal observation. This is one of the artwork proposals I've been developing from these fieldwork experiences. And this proposal is the focus of a newly formed RSPB artwork working group made up of reserve wardens, ecologists, interested volunteers and RSPB public engagement and communication staff. In this group, we discuss the opportunities and challenges of making artwork designed to engage both human and non-human participants, including multi-species ethics, how animals may engage with a sculpture's form and materiality, proximity and how to encourage polite forms of encounter, accessibility and visitor experience. So to conclude, I intend this research to contribute to environmental discourse first as a body of ambitious sculptural artwork which will be experienced on site, catalyzing or perhaps intensifying human animal encounter. And then as a photographic document, giving access to the artwork and wildlife to audiences remote to the reserve, an aspect which has grown in significance during this year's pandemic. For the RSPB, I believe this research could not only suggest ways in which creative research to different stages and discourses within conservation, and lastly, as an art practitioner, I hope my research will contribute to the development of transdisciplinary and collaborative methods and illustrate ways of producing environmentally motivated artwork that values and give credit to the input of both the highly skilled and dev devoted researchers, restorers and conservers of our environment, and also the more than human world of, of which we still have so much to learn. Hannah, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. And Gemma, thank you too. That was great. Um, I, I've just, it was very, that point you made, Hannah, there about um, for that, the artwork engagement group, that was a lot of things to consider when making an artwork to, and, and to be thinking about how, not only how humans interact with it and engage with it, but how animals and species also um, interact with it. It was really interesting. Um, to think about. Um, does does that make things quite difficult in terms of thinking about how how the work you make to, to, to think about all those different facets? It's it's certainly a challenge, but I've I've been leaning into it as a way, as a, a creative stimulus. I, I have these amazing meetings with um, 
uh, moth enthusiasts and <laughs> RSVB conservation scientists and um, reserve wardens and volunteers, and they and they raised quite um, uh, significant issues about how I might have conceived an artwork to do with um, how it how it functions, kind of, um, whether it's ecologically um, uh, sustainable in its materials or or kind of in terms of animal behaviour and. And I have been taking these suggestions and, and using them to fuel and shape the creative process rather than seeing them as a yeah. rocket. And I think that's that's the, the joy of doing it in a research context in that all that work, all that collaborative work is is part of my research. So I can I can luxuriate a little bit in having a longer research process to really um explore and and um, and gain from the knowledge of all the individuals who have been who I've been working with. Um, I wanted to ask you just a little bit um, about, because you mentioned, because um, I'm thinking in terms of kind of urban environments and you mentioned uh, the renewable energy projects and I was quite interested in hearing just a wee bit, um, bit more about them and how you've worked with Aberdeen on those um, as well. Yes, so I, I became um, aware of the Donside um, Renewable Energy Aberdeen, um, Aberdeen's Donside Renewable Energy Scheme, which is a community initiated project and the first um, inner city small scale um, hydroelectric scheme that um, was there created by the residents, maintained by the residents and all the profits from the sale of that energy was going directly into their community to um, to help kind of rewild an area to, to um, put on a programme of events. So it's a really inspiring project in Aberdeen and it mirrors what's happened in Scotland in more remote communities, like famously on, on the Isle of Egg, um, where I've also um, done some work. So I, I thought it was fascinating that a community within Aberdeen, which is known as the oil capital of Scotland, had, had taken the initiative and, um, and so successfully financed and were running um, this renewable energy scheme. So the project that I did with them is, is still kind of ongoing because we we um, have a final event um, still to do. But I was um, I made a series of sculptures which which uh, were in celebration of what they've achieved and were inspired by the the logarithmic kind of spiral of of the um, of the Archimedes screw turbine that they installed. Oh, that's interesting. It's interesting because we we have done some work around climate change parks, and we worked very much. The pilot we did was in Aberdeen, and they took on that idea around renewable energy and um, changing green space for kind of climate change adaptation mitigation. So it's interesting to hear about another community led project. And Gemma, I want just wanted to ask you about. Um, in, in terms of the kind of commissions that come to artists, do, do they, where do they, do they, are they sometimes self-generated or have they come from a whole range of different um, organisations or people um, in terms of those commissions? Yeah, well, I would, I would say it does vary a lot. So I believe the Dundee Urban Orchard Project came from the artists who, you know, conceived of the idea and then sought community buy-in and um, partnership funding and so on. Um, however, with the, the projects we're involved in, the commission does tend to come through uh, what you might call a problem holder or an environmental organisation who has a specific issue that they're interested in exploring and addressing, and okay. including through a creative approach. Um, so, for example, the Natural Resource Defence Council, I believe um, one of their team members over a number of years kind of developed the case for working collaboratively with artists and built up funding both within the organization but externally to arts funders working in the United States and funding work there. So she was able to kind of make the case for this collaborative approach and then I think they identified a series of initiatives where artists could apply to work with them and put out an open call and um, sort of go from there. So I'd say it does vary but our experience sort of tends to be that it can come from this, this problem holder and then we we sort of seek out where we can um, source funds and support. So, Gemma, if we had um, in in another in another city or in Glasgow, if we had someone say um, 
interested in trying to work well working with a visual artist on on a project would would they could they cut, approach you and get advice from you or is that kind of what the toolkit is doing as well giving advice around how to do that yeah yeah absolutely um i'd say both uh, we're yeah. we're always here for a chat <laughs> um would have been in person but now digitally um, so yeah, we're very ha happy to sort of help advise projects that are, you know, in the early stages of developing and just offer our experience um, as well as the toolkit is, you know, free to access um, resource that was just launched a few weeks ago and is built on our experience of our own European project, which we've been running for the past two years um, with embedded artists in four different cities. So it's kind of a bit like Hannah come from action research and is, is now sort of out there in the world, um, hoping to support similar collaborations. So oh, that's great. Yeah, um, either either or. I would recommend looking at the toolkit, but we're also very yeah. happy to sort of help yeah. advise. Because I think that sometimes can be the issue that people don't really know where to start or they don't know or they kind of um, think of um, visual art in one kind of format. They don't can't, don't think so much about this the sort of research side of things that Hannah's involved in or um, so I suppose what would you say in terms of if someone was saying, well, why would we bother? Why would we want to get a visual artist involved or an artist involved? What what would you say, Gemma, would be the the kind of the advantages of, of doing that or the benefits of doing it? Sure. Well, I guess I would say they're multiple. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the sort of first key reason that we try to advocate is that climate change presents a huge challenge to society and really requires different ways of doing things and artists are very skilled in bringing that different perspective um, offering different approaches um, and also sort of question questioning you know underlying values or principles that might you know be keeping us within a certain way of thinking but actually we need to be you know somewhere else and coming at it from a different angle so I think you know, the angle that Hannah's proposing to think from the non-human perspective is really valuable and interesting here. And I think, you know, just hearing about that, it sort of completely changes your perception of how we approach um, managing natural um, conservation reserves, but could equally be applied to different issues. So I suppose for me, that that's the kind of primary reason is that it, it can really help um, catalyze different ways of thinking and doing things within projects. Yes, and I would add to that that um, if you think back to particular experiences that have had a transformational effect on you, um, I think they are often associated with um, experiencing a kind of an amazing piece of theatre or um, artwork or a song or something that has um, sh uh, had such an effect on you that it that it um, sparks some kind of transformational change in, in your behaviour. And I I'm really interested in what those moments are and I think we can liken them to um, nature lovers experiences of wildlife if you if you have an eagle fly over your head it's so memorable it's such a, a tangible experience that it can may well go on to affect how you think about the place in which you had that experience and the yeah the the more than human world with which um kind of how, how with which we can share um our spaces and so I'm I'm really interested in how an artwork can instigate these type of transformational experiences as, as well as as other forms like like coming in um, close contact a close encounter with, with charismatic wildlife so how, how can we help to catalyze some of these um, transformational experiences that, that help to instigate behavioral change oh well Hannah that's a very very nice note to end on I hope as a result we do get to um, experience more transformational experiences and particularly in in urban environments it just it'd be um, great to see more projects um, using kind of um, design visual art um, artistic thinking within them so um, we will have to finish up there because we have um, the stage is just um, live with our next plenary session but thank you very much both of you that was great thank you um, and thanks to everybody that um, joined us um, today as well. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you both.